Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 15, where Peter stand, or excuse me, when Jesus stands before Pilate. The soldiers mock Jesus. Jesus is ultimately crucified and the burial of Jesus. Let's start here at verse 1. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council held a consultation, bound Jesus. In other words, they probably put him in chains and, you know, had him in like, almost like handcuffs and shackles, carried him away and delivered him up to Pilate. Pilate said to him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered, so you, so you say. In other words, yes, it is. That's, yes, I am. <laughs> so you say. The chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him, have you no answer? See how many things these, they testify against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate marveled. He's like, why aren't you saying anything? Aren't you defending yourself? Now at the feast, this would be the feast of Passover, he used to release to them one prisoner whom they asked of him. Well, isn't that nice of him to, to release a prisoner during Passover? They knew that Pass he knew that Passover was one of the, you know, the most holy of all uh, feasts. And so he's like, well, I'll do you all a favor. I'll release somebody here as a celebration. There was one called Barabbas. Now you need to understand, and this is a Greek. This is a transliteration from the Greek, which is actually a transliteration from the Hebrew. Bar meaning son, and Abbas, which is Abba, son of the father. Okay, very interesting that Jesus would be right beside the, uh, someone whose name was a son of the father. There was one called Barabbas, son of the father bound with his fellow insurgents, men who in the insurrection had committed murder. The multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do as he always did for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that for envy the chief priests had delivered him up. Hmm. In other words, he knew that, it, that Jesus wasn't there because he did something wrong. He was just there because he because these people were jealous of him. Hmm. So he knew that Jesus was innocent. But the chief priest stirred up the multitude that he should release Barabbas to them instead. Instead, release the son of the father. Pilate asked them again, what then should I do with, uh, to him who, who you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out exceedingly, Crucify him! So a lot of people today are like that. You know, they, they bring out these really serious things and you ask them for reasonable explanations and they can't give you a reasonable explana explanation. They just ignore you. They ignore the question. How some people are like that today. They are unreasonably indignant against righteous, the righteous. Verse 15. Pilate, wishing to please the multitude, released Barabbas to them and handed over Jesus when he had flogged him to be crucified. Flogged, beaten him, basically. The soldiers led him away within the court which is the praetorium. And they called together the whole co cohort. They clothed him with purple and weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on him. Now, this is significant that he would have the crown of thorns on his head. If you know in the book of Revelation, or excuse me, the book of Genesis, uh, the thorns were the result or the curse of sin. Okay? So the thorns represented sin more or less or the presence of sin. Because of the sin, God said he cursed the ground with thorns. Now they're taking that thorns and putting it back on Jesus' head. Okay? 
I'm representing reversing the curse, okay? Verse 18, they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing their knees, they did homage to him. It's just all mocking. When they had mocked him, they took the purple robe, the purple off him, and put his own garments on him. They led him out to crucify him. They compelled one passing by, coming from the country, Simon of Shimon, that would be, of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to go with them, that he might bear his cross. See, Jesus was beaten so bad that he probably could not even bear his own cross. He probably couldn't pick up his own cross. And the idea is when he was flogged, there's this thing called the Roman Canine Tales that um, a lot of people believe that was used back then, which is a, a whip with basically nine whips in one, nine whips in one whip. And on the end of each one of these nine whips, they would have uh, pieces of metal or glass or something like that that would dig into your skin as, as it hit and tear your skin off. You know, as uh, Isaiah said, it, they, they tore his beard right off of him and he was beyond recognition. Um, could have been done with the Roman, Roman cat of nine tails. Okay, so uh, they brought him to the place called Golgotha which is being interpreted the place of a skull. They offered wine mixed with myrrh to drink, but he didn't, he didn't take it. Myrrh is a very bitter thing, okay? And again, wine, he would not drink that. Okay, it is a, another instance of him refusing wine, okay? Uh, check out my earlier teachings uh, re regarding the Lord's Supper on more details about that. Verse 24, Crucifying him, they parted his garments among them, casting lots on them, what each should take. It was the third hour, about 9 a.m., it says here in the notes, and they crucified him. The superscription, which would be the, the, the writing that was over his head, uh, of, the, of his accusation, okay, this is the crime that he did, written over, written over him, the king of the Jews. With him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and one on his left hand. The scripture was fulfilled, saying he was counted with the transgressors. transgressors. The NU manuscripts, um, which some believe to be the oldest manuscripts, uh, omit verse 28. Verse 29, those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Obviously, these are very f ignorant people that have no clue what they're talking about like a lot of people today do. Verse 31, Likewise, also the chief priests mocking them, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said he saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe him. The TR, Textus Receptus, which would be that which the, what the King James was translated from, omits him. Those who were crucified with him also insulted him. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So that would be from noon until three. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A direct, a direct quote from Psalm 22 verse 1, written hundreds of years, if not about a thousand years earlier. Very, very important to note here. When Jesus was on the cross, Paul said he became sin for us. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man will be lifted up on the cross. Okay? So he became as a serpent. He became sin for us. Now, when when he was 
the Son of God, the Holy Son of God, before he became sin on the cross, he always referred to God as Father. It was always Father, not Father God or God. It was Father, okay? Very important to know how he addressed God or his Father. <laughs> he addressed him as Father. When you pray, say Father. When you looked up and prayed, say Father. Okay, he didn't say God. He didn't say anything else. He said Father. But in as sin as the serpent on the cross, he didn't say Father because the Father, he's no more, he can no longer identify with God as Father, but rather as God. This is a very deep spiritual teaching that a lot of you would not understand unless you really had it there. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has eyes to see, let him see. When God, the word God, Elohim, refers to the Creator, it's a distant being. It's a distant uh, personality. It's a distant God, okay? That is why Adam sinned, because he was created. I, Isaiah said, God said through Isaiah, I create darkness, but I form light. I am light, but I create darkness. How do I create darkness? By withdrawing myself. Okay? Um, so he creates darkness. The creation is corruptible. Whereas his form, his being is incorruptible. It's light. That's why John said, he who is born of God cannot sin because you are you, you partake of the nature and the, the God's seed is in you. Okay? Um, you are part of, he, you share the same nature as him, more or less. Okay? And so... That is why Jesus did not sin, because he was the Son of God. But Adam sinned because he was the creation of God. Are you getting me? You following me here? Okay. So when you, anybody who speaks of God and just speaks of him as God, you're talking from a very disconnected point of view, a, very, a sin point of view. You're talking from the point of view of sin, darkness, you know, as the serpents, okay? As Jesus did on the cross, my God, my God. But as a born-again believer, as a born-again person who is truly born again, I'm, I'm talking about all the old is gone, all the old sin, sinful ways are gone. You are a brand new creation. You have completely, you have repented, you have turned from sin. You are... You can say with, with Paul, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. This, my sin is dead on the cross, as Paul said in, in Colossians, in Colossians uh, chapter 2, also in Galatians chapter 5, also in Galatians chapter 2, also in Romans chapter 6. If you are really born again, you don't call God God. You call him Father. You look at him, your relationship is Father, not God. Okay, but if you are in the sin position, you call him God, not Father. The Father is God is not the Father of sin. Okay, God creates things that are corruptible. Everything that He did with His hands, all of His creation, will in one point in time be corrupted in one way or another. Okay, rotten, uh, return to dust. Okay, uh, die, rot, whatever, turn to dust, corrupted. Okay. But what is his nature and his essence is light and eternal, you know, eternal life, okay? When you're born again, you have the eternal life. You partake of his eternal life. And by the way, if you're really born again, you don't have, you don't have to have anybody tell you that you're born again. If you, have to have, if you have to have someone tell you you're born again, you're not. Simple, simple as that, okay? Uh, if you have the spirit of Almighty God, the most powerful uh, person in all of the universe uh, living inside of you, you know it. Okay, you don't have you know when you have the light, the the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection living in you, uh, you know it. 
when you have the life, when you have the substance of God Almighty in you. You don't have to have anybody say, oh, by the way, you're born again now. No. So God, Jesus in his sinful position, in his position of sin, taking on the form of sin in the sense of being that serpent on the pole, being, the, the, being Jesus on the cross, becoming sin for us, as Paul said, did not say Father, said God. And by the way, all of you who are listening to me, never ever say Father God. Uh, it doesn't work. It's either Father or God, okay? Uh, it depends what position you're taking. It depends who, if you're, if you're just a creation of God, call him God. If you are really born again, call him Father. Born into his, that's why he's Father, because you're born uh, of him. Verse 35, some of those who stood by when they heard it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. So they didn't understand when he said, you know, El Eloi, or in other uh, gospels, Ali, Ali, which is Eliyahu, okay? That's Elijah, okay? Elijah's uh, Hebrew name is Eliyahu, okay? So that's why they thought that he was calling Elijah, because he's Ali or Eloi, right? They, was, they thought he was calling Elijah. One ran, filling a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave him, a, gave him to drink, saying, let him be, and let's see whether Elijah comes, uh, comes to take him down. So they're still testing and mocking him. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and gave up the spirit. He died. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, okay, this is a, this is a tough man, okay? This is a, uh, is a soldier that's over 100. That's why it's centurion. He's a man that's over 100, okay? He's over 100 other soldiers. A man of authority here. When the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women watching from afar, among whom were both Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the less, and of Joses. So that'd be James, his real name would be Yaakov and Yoshe, um, or Yose and Shalom, uh, Salom, or that would be like Solomon, okay? Um, sh uh, Shalom, yes. 41 who, when he was in Galilee, followed him and serving him and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. When the evening had now come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before Shabbat, Yosef of Arimathea, a prominent counselor, or a prominent council member, who also himself was looking for God's kingdom, came. <clears throat> he boldly went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate marveled if, if, he had, uh, if he were already dead. Well, he, he, you know, he, didn't, he didn't expect Jesus to die so fast, but Jesus was so badly beaten that he did. You know, look at uh, Isaiah chapter 53 and chapter 52, how badly beating, beaten Jesus really was. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether or not he had been dead long. When he found out from the centurion, he, he granted the body to Yosef. So everybody knew he was dead. The centurion confirmed he was dead. Pilate confirmed that he was dead. Uh, they, they wrapped his body in a linen cloth, verse 46. And we know that linen cloth today is, to believe, is believed to be the Shroud of Turin, which is still around today. And taking him down, wound him in the linen cloth and laid him in a tomb which had been cut out of a rock. He rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joses saw where he was laid. So they were there, they watched everything, okay? So, that again concludes another one of our sessions. That's Matthew chapter 15. May God give you wisdom, revelation, and spiritual insight beyond all of your peers. And, uh, you know, may God, as you, as you go away and you meditate upon the things that we're talking about and meditate on the scripture, may God bless you richly and give you eyes to see and ears to hear. Thanks again for watching.